हेर हयर हान हम माधवान कुंजवी हान हे जय जय गोपी जनबा गिरिवर हान हे जय धूपी जनवाबार सूर्यनंदन भ्रज झन हंझाया नंदन भ्रज धन झमून चेहर झमून चेर भार
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare <laughs> Ha 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 Sankirtan ki jai. Where's Sarvana Bindu? Oh, yeah. Ar- Archan. Mm-hmm. Okay, so. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So we're reading from Srimad Bhagavad Gita, chapter 18, text 68 and 69. Yaridam paramam guyam mad bhaktesha avidashyati Bhaktamayi Param Gritva Maumai Vaisyatya Samsayaha Yaridam Paramam Guyam Mad Bhakteshwa Vidashnati Bhaktamayi Param Gritva Mami Vasyat Yasam Sayaha Chant Hmm. So I'll read translations from 68 and 69. 
For one who explains this sec supreme secret to the devotees, pure devotional service is guaranteed. At the end, he will come back to me. There is no servant in this world more dear to me than he, nor will there ever be one more dear. <clears throat> I'll read that again. For one who explains this supreme secret to the devotees, pure devotional service is guaranteed. And at the end, he will come back to me. There is no servant in this world more dear to me than he, nor will there ever be one more dear. <laughs> Purport. Generally, it is advised that Bhagavad Gita be discussed amongst the devotees only. For those who are not devotees will, un will understand neither Krishna nor the Bhagavad Gita. Those who do not accept Krishna as he is and Bhagavad Gita as it is should not try to explain Bhagavad Gita whimsically and become offenders. Bhagavad Gita should be explained to persons who are ready to accept Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is a subject matter for the devotees only and not for philosophical speculators. Anyone, however, who tries sincerely to present Bhagavad Gita as it is will advance in devotional activities and reach pure devotional state of life. As a result, such pure devotion is sure to go back home, back to Godhead. Omagyan timirandasya genajana salakaya chaksun militam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Namaum Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudamani Pacharine Nevrishesa Sunyavari Pasyat Yade Satarine Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare hmm. So Prabhupada would often say there is about 700 versions of the Bhagavad Gita and these many of these versions have been floating around the uh, material world for many many decades even back early as the end of the 19 1800s around the end of around the time Prabhupada took birth Bhagavad Gita was circulating in Western countries they were being Vivekananda was one of the first to bring Bhagavad Gita over from from India, and there was other Ramakrishna's version of Bhagavad Gita. And Prabhupada one time, well, actually, Prabhupada was using Ramakrishna's version of Gita before he had his own Bhagavad Gita as it is. And he asked one devotee to read one verse from the ninth chapter, Manmana Baba Bhat Bhakto Mam Yuji Mam Namaskuru. And then Prabhupada said, read the translation. And then Krishna says, you know, always remember me, become my devotee, worship me, and offer your homage to me. Surely you will come to me, I promise you this. Actually, that verse, the translation is a little different. Engage your mind always thinking of me, become my devotee, offer obeisance to me and worship me. Being completely absorbed in me, surely you will come to me. Mami Vaishya Yuktai Vam Atmanam Matparayanaha. So Prabhupada had the verse read by one of his disciples. And then he said, read the purport. So there was some purport there. And in the beginning it said, well, it says not to Krishna do we have to surrender, but to the unborn, unmanifested aspect within Krishna. 
And Prabhupada became quite disturbed, in fact, very disturbed. And he said, just see, Krishna is saying surrender to me, and he's saying something else. <laughs> so, and Prabhupada went on to explain that we shouldn't try to take Krishna's words and twist it to make our own interpretations. He says, when something is clear, there is no need for interpretation. So we have, and as Prabhupada said, for many, many decades before we presented our Bhagavad Gita as it is, there were so many versions, but how many people actually became really devotees of Krishna? Especially in the Western world, there was hardly any. So only when we presented Bhagavad Gita as it is, as Krishna wants it to be explained, in other words, according to Krishna's uh, meaning, then uh, we start making devotees. Because when you give it the way it is, it has power. When you take it away from its actual meaning and twist it around, as Prabhupada said, many people who are campaigning for political offices, especially in India, would use Bhagavad Gita as their campaign platform. They would quote certain verses from the Bhagavad Gita as a way to put forth their own ideas on how to lead the country. So Bhagavad Gita is misused. Prabhupada said, if you want to write you're, if you want to, if you want to uh, write, don't take Krishna's words and make it your words and call it your Bhagavad Gita. You write your own book. <laughs> write your own book. So, when Prabhupada presented Bhagavad Gita as it is, the way Krishna intended it to be, and then it became popular around the world. And so here it says that this knowledge is only understandable by the devotees. In other words, those who are mental speculators, those who have no interest in Krishna, but are having interest in taking advantage of philosophical knowledge, either to present some ideas of their own using Krishna's words, or to take the... Uh, the pure teachings of Krishna and use it in order to further their own interests. I remember when I was preaching in America, I was getting with this one magazine and there was uh, many articles about spiritual life in it. So there was a very lengthy article in this one, ver one edition of this magazine on the Bhagavad Gita and was done by one professor from one university. And so he was saying, he didn't at all acknowledge that Krishna, the Supreme Lord, is the speaker of Bhagavad Gita. He simply presented his interpretation of Bhagavad Gita as a very literary expert presentation on spiritual topics. <laughs> Without mentioning Krishna, who is the speaker of the Gita, he glorified the literary ornamentation of Gita and, and using flowery words to describe Krishna's statements. When I read that, I became quite concerned and a little disturbed. So I found out the name of the author, who was a professor at one university in America. So I decided to connect with him. <laughs> so I found out his office number and I called him on the phone <laughs> and I explained who, uh, who I was and I wanted to explain that actually it's a, it's a very nice literary presentation of Bhagavad Gita you made, but somehow or other you missed the main point. <laughs> that the Supreme Personality of God is the speaker of Bhagavad Gita. And then he asked me, well, who are you? And I explained. He said, are you some spiritualist? I said, well, I'm a member of the 
International Society for Krishna Consciousness. <laughs> and that is our main scripture. Oh, and as soon as he heard that, immediately he said, Oh, well, thank you for calling. I have to go. <laughs> he said, Oh, Iskon, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, as soon as people find out that, uh, you know, their Bhagavad Gita is really not really worth anything because Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita has sold how many copies around the world? Millions. Literally millions. There's so many editions being printed. And we have so many, what we say, different way, not not changing the words, but abridged dictionaries, abridged Gita, so many things. So practically it's become a household scripture all around the world now, Bhagavad Gita. Gita. And it's Prabhupada's Gita. And so when people see the, the Gita now, or when they think of the Gita, they think of Prabhupada's Gita. <laughs> it's become so popular, even in all through the Western world now. Because it's presented the way it is, as Krishna wants it. So here... It says that this cannot, should not be, this teaching of Bhagavad Gita should not be explained to those who are not devoted. But then again, we preach. But we don't explain Bhagavad Gita as a means for what here it says people who are mental speculators who do not accept Krishna as the speaker of Bhagavad Gita who do not accept Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they will never understand. But Krishna is speaking from the position of the Absolute Truth. So just like he says in the following verse, And I declare that he who studies this sacred conversation of ours worships me by his intelligence. So he's referring to him as the top, himself as the topmost worship. And of course, a few verses earlier, he gives the essence of Bhagavad Everyone should surrender to him. So what is the use of reading Bhagavad Gita or studying Bhagavad Gita if doesn't, one doesn't accept Krishna as the Supreme Lord and surrender to him in devotion? It becomes just a, a family affair where people want to read something philosophical, something literary, uh, astute. And what happens is that they... Uh, they get the wrong interpretations. Mm -hmm. And so here you'll find in many times you, um, Vyasadeva, he placed Bhagavad Gita within the Mahabharata mm -hmm. because people like to hear about adventure, war, romance, and Bhagavad Gita, Mahabharata is a lot like that. So Mahabharata and Ramayana are called the fifth Veda for people who are not very, what we say, uh, developed in intellectual knowledge. In other words, for sutras and the others. And so in order to get people to read Bhagavad Gita, he very, what we say, intelligently stuck it within the Mahabharata. So few people like to write, read Mahabharata. And another thing he does, he doesn't say Sri Krishna Uvacha, he says Sri Bhagavan Uvacha. Why? Because he did that because he wanted to say that, yes, Bhagavan is he who is one in six opulence. Krishna is the speaker of Bhagavad Gita, therefore he is, he is known as Bhagavan, or the supreme absolute truth like that. So therefore, in order to clarify Krishna's position, he didn't say, see Krishna. Because people will say, well, well, Krishna, he was just a, you know, maybe he was a very powerful Kshatriya, or he was maybe a great, a great orator of, of uh, political, because when Krishna came, he was involved with politics a lot. <laughs> Yeah, probably Prabhupada says that one lecture. He was mostly, in, you know, when he left Vrindavan, he left Vrindavan to take care of Kamsa, remove him from the throne and establish Ugartrena as the, the king. 
he wanted to remove uh, the, not remove, but to establish Yudhisthira on the throne because he wanted to establish the devotees as the rulers of the world. So Krishna was very much a political figure. Some people will say, well, he was just a good politician, oh, like that, and he did so many things. But he's a speaker of the Bhagavad Gita, and therefore Vyasadeva is very intelligent. He says, Sri Bhagavan Uvacha, instead of Sri Krishna Uvacha. And then Krishna goes on to say in the next verse, one who explains this science to the devotees, those who are devoted, that's what he means, those who are devoted to Krishna, those who are devoted to, uh, devo to activities in devotional service, they are ready to hear the science of uh, transcendental knowledge as Krishna presented it in the Bhagavad Gita. Others cannot understand or not in a position to understand. And therefore, that's why I say Krishna says, only one who explains the supreme secret to the devotees. So we preach sometimes to the non-devotees, the teachings of Bhagavad Gita, but we present the philosophical knowledge. And ultimately, when based on their receptivity, we explain as much as they can understand and not more. Mm -hmm. And Krishna, you'll see, he doesn't talk about his intimate pastimes anywhere in the Bhagavad Gita. He's only talking about karma, uh, how this material world works, who, what are the living entities, what is their relationship with the Supreme, and who is the Supreme. That's all. He doesn't talk anything about his private affairs with his devotees in Vrindavan like that, or Dwarka, or any of the holy places. He's just talking about what we say philosophical knowledge, and he kept it very basic. Uh, Krishna again spoke the same knowledge again, which is now part of the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. It's called the Uddhava Gita. He took the same knowledge that he presented to Arjun, but he presented it in a little bit more developed way with a little bit more understanding and higher higher spiritual principles. But Bhagavatam <clears throat> begins where, where Bhagavad Gita leaves off. In other words, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, surrender to me, give up all varieties of religion and worship me, Masuchaha. He says, do not fear. There's nothing to fear because I will give you protection. Do not hesitate and do not worry. Masucha has interpreted three different worry ways like that. So he's encouraging everyone to surrender. He says, give up all kinds of ideas on how you can make progress in spiritual life. That's what he means by giving up all varieties of religion. He says, give up all those ideas on how you think you can make spiritual advancement by following different processes of spiritual life. You have your ideas, but they may be nice, but until you surrender to me, you cannot understand you know, the process of devotion. So one has to surrender to Krishna. One has to surrender to Krishna means to accept Krishna as the absolute authority. He is the absolute authority. And therefore, whatever he says, it's for the benefit of the conditioned souls to bring them back to Godhead. Now, here it is explained that whoever preaches this message of Bhagavad Gita becomes very dear to Krishna. And as Krishna says, there's no one in a world more dear to me than anyone, nor will anyone be more dear. The one who explains this science. So here, this is our mission. Our mission is to learn Bhagavad Gita, live Bhagavad Gita, not just learn it philosophically. There was one devotee in the early days, he knew every verse by heart. 
all 700 verses. So he was impressed, he impressed the devotees. So they wanted to bring him to Prabhupada. So they brought him to Prabhupada. He was a little proud that he knew the whole Bhagavad Gita. So this devotee said, Prabhupada, this devotee, he knows the entire Bhagavad Gita by heart. Prabhupada didn't even look at him. He said, is there any service he can do? <laughs> Prabhupada wasn't impressed. So anybody can memorize anything, just like you can teach a parrot to chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> and I've seen parrots chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> And but when the death comes along or when the cat comes along, then it's no longer Hare Krishna. <laughs> cat, cat, cat. <laughs> so yeah, so just rote memorization of philosophical and spiritual principles really don't really uh, change the heart or even the mind. People like to learn a lot of things. And there's many scholars who discuss the teachings of Bhagavad Gita. And they have their own interpretations. Not only Bhagavad Gita, but Bhagavatam and also Chaitanya Charitamrita. They make their own conclusions based on their own, what we say, fertile understanding of the text. But... Therefore, the devotees who are practicing Krishna consciousness, they may not be pure devotees, but they have faith in Krishna, they have faith in the words of Krishna, and they're trying to, they're, they're trying to apply these teachings in their life in a day-to-day -day way. And when they speak these teachings, it has merit, it has value. And therefore, it says, Krishna says, anyone who makes an effort to preach this or to teach this to others becomes very, very dear to me. Prabhupada says there's two kinds of devotees. One who are interested in their own spiritual development and one, those who are interested in giving spiritual messages and, and knowledge to others. He says the second is actually gains the, the, the mercy of the Lord. <laughs> It's nice, we are not bhajan anandis, we are ghost anandis. Bhajan anandis means we're only interested in our own bhajan. Of course, right now, because of the, what we say, ghost anandi lockdown, <laughs> the ghost anandis are locked down, so they have to come up with different ways to uh, stay bhajan anandi, to stay ghost anandis. Ghost Anandi simply means one who preaches. Bhajan Anandi means one who does his own bhajan, and that's all. <laughs> so that's our movement. We're Ghost Anandis, and that is we're interested in giving Krishna consciousness to others. And here's where we start the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. Because when people have a, can learn Bhagavad Gita and start to apply it in their life, they, under, they can start to understand uh, how to make advancement in devotional service, and how this material world works, and how to avoid the traps of maya. This is the, the benefit of spiritual knowledge. It teaches you how to avoid na maya. That's why he's learning these books, studying these books, and applying the knowledge of the books is actually the foundation for the direction that the successful execution of devotional service. Mm -hmm. From reading comes studying, from studying comes application, from application comes realization, from realization comes devotional qualities and what we say, uh, yeah, devotional qualities, skills, and values, mm -hmm. virtues, virtues. So, therefore, devotees should study these books and whatever opportunities you can find, give it, speak to anyone and everyone. You know, right now we are limited in our interactive, you know, people are not coming to the mandir, but we have the internet, we still have that, and we have... Uh, maybe a few other ways to get this message out. And it's important that we do. 
because we can stay strong in our Krishna consciousness as we find ways and being in our very, what we say, limited resource right now, we can talk to each other about the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita. I remember when I was in New Vrindavan in my beginning days of Krishna consciousness, um, devotees would have many times have a hard time staying awake in the Bhagavatam class because devotees were working really hard and they would go to bed late and get up really early. So as soon as they sat down in Bhagavatam class, they would become sleepy, and sometimes fall asleep. So we devised a way to keep devotees awake. And one of them is that every devotee has to ask at least one other devotee throughout the day, what did they say in the Bhagavatam class? <laughs> and so that helped the devotees to stay awake or make an effort to stay awake. And at the same time, it stimulated Krishna conscious kata. Krishna kata was circulating there. So it was a good way to remember what we were heard and to you know, discuss it with others. So, yeah. This knowledge is not meant to be locked up in some box and kept in one's room. <laughs> it's meant to be distributed everywhere. And those who don't want to hear, just like it says the ninth offense of the holy name is to preach the glories of the Lord to the faithless. So better not to speak to those who are not receptive or those who are not, what we say, inclined to hear. But there are people who are, especially now. I was talking to one devotee, and he's driving a cab. He says people now, he's giving everyone a book, and uh, keeps bhajans going on in his cab. And people are really uh, happy. They said, oh, it's so nice being inside here. It's very, it's good feeling. So he's, uh, you know, he's using his occupation cab driver to distribute books and to connect people with Krishna consciousness. So everyone should think, how can I preach Krishna consciousness like that? And this is our mission. Our mission is not to simply keep the temples going and then that's all. Our mission is to reach out and make as many people as we can uh, devotees of the Lord. Well, that's Prabhupada's mission. It's a preaching mission. <clears throat> it's not a chapati flipping mission. <laughs> if we get the chapatis and the sabji and uh, we have nice breakfast, lunch, then we're happy and therefore we're, things go on. No, and that's not our, our mood is to somehow or other get this message out. And the world really needs to hear it. People want to hear it. They don't, they're looking for something. They're not sure what they're looking for, but they're looking for something. Especially now in this difficult time. I'm sure people are turning to God more, but still, a lot of times they don't know how to turn to God. They only turn to God when things get difficult. And God will help, but really, really turning to God means making God the focus of everything you do in life, and not just when things fall apart. <laughs> okay, so these are some points we can think about. And here, and yeah, it says, this verse is very important. Prabhupada quoted it so many times. One who preached this message becomes very dear to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And as Prabhupada says, anyone, however, who tries to sincerely to present Bhagavad Gita as it is, will advance in devotional activities and reach the pure devotional state of life. As a result of such pure devotion, he is sure to go back home, back to Godhead. So. 
Prabhupada says, if you want to be recognized by Krishna, speak this message to others. <laughs> okay, so we can all do that. Any questions, comments? Thank you for the lecture, Maharaj. Regarding Srila Prabhupada's mission, um, um, it is said that, uh, and we know that up to the last days of his manifested pastimes here on earth, uh, he used to uh, think and lecture on um, the establishment of Arnashram Dharma in this world that we see today. And although he did, um, it is emphasized throughout the scriptures, throughout uh, his teachings, that we should teach this, um, speak this message of Krishna to everyone. Um, what role does setting an example of Varnashram Dharma play in this preaching and Srila Prabhupada's mission? Well, there are different kinds of Vanashram Daiva. And Prabhupada was talking about Daivi Vanashram. Daivi means spiritual. In other words, evaluating the nature of the individual and engaging him or her according to that nature in service to the Lord. So, when we came into devotional service, the bodhis were given different services. And it was important, the only thing that was important was if there was people available, put them in whatever services we need to get done. And we saw a lot of times the bodhis were not able to grow so much because of that. That was an emergency. But Prabhupada, in 1974, so people are chanting Hare Krishna, but they're going away. Now we should establish this Vanarsham. Then you can hear this tape, March 14, 1974, in uh, Vrindavan. Prabhupada spoke for one hour, and it's a discussion with Ridhananda Maharaj on, re on establishing Vanarsham. Prabhupada wanted Vanarsham colleges where devotees who are in a Brahminical uh, qualifications would teach the different varnas to others how to become a kshatriya, how to become a vaisya, like that. <laughs> so what he wanted, he wanted devotees to excel in Krishna consciousness by evaluating their nature and engaging them according to that nature. And that still hasn't been re fully established yet. There are a place, a few pockets, pockets in the world where there is an effort to establish that. And Prabhupada writes that in the first canto of Bhagavad, Bhagavatam. That is the duty of the spiritual master to evaluate the, the nature of his devotee, his disciple, and to engage them according to that nature. So... There's people who have Brahminical natures, people who have Kshatriya natures, people who have Vaishya natures. But most of us are Sudras because it says in this age, Kalo Sudra Sambhavan. Everyone's born Sudra. Therefore, Prabhupada said, we need this Vanashram College as a means to train people in the different Varnas and then engage them accordingly in different devotional service. So that was Prabhupada's idea. 
now there is Van Arsham College in Bradadesh in Belgium that's going on. <clears throat> so that's been, and there's an education system there. But uh, it's also the duty of the temple leaders to see what is the nature of the devotees that are working under them and engage them in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of education, evaluation, engagement like that. Um, Prabhupada was getting a report from one Gurukul in Hyderabad, I think it was, where the, uh, the, the Gurukul teacher was saying they had one boy. He was always disturbing the class. And uh, he, he would just, you know, disturb all the time. And he wasn't so much interested in learning the lessons. Prabhupada said, well, there's no need to train him to become a brahmana because he, that is not his nature, obviously. So engage him, put him on the farm and let him do some farm work. Like that. So Prabhupada wanted this system put in place. And he said that a lot before he, just before he left. <clears throat> So we're still working on that. <laughs> we're still working on that. And you'll find that people excel in their service when, they, when they're trained in a certain way and then they can uh, serve in that same way. <laughs> because these qualities re remain dormant in Kali Yuga. Therefore, it says everyone's born sutra. Therefore, training and education is required. And that's what the purpose of an ashram co college is meant. But before you can actually even evaluate, you have to train people in some of the qualities of a human being, which are mentioned in the, in the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam in the seventh canto. I think it's chapter 11, verses 8 through 12. There's 30, 30 qualities of a human being, uh, which are the foundations for devotional service. And some of them are actually uh, the limbs of bhakti. They're the angas. So those 30 qualities are the educational principles that need to be taught to everyone who comes into training for devotional service. You can't just look at someone and say, well, he's a Kshatriya because he's passionate and he's a Brahmin because he's more studious. No, you have to use a whole system of evaluate, training first and then evaluation. Once the training is given, the training will help bring out their qualities and then evaluation can be made from there. And then once evaluation is made, then engaging. And when people are engaged according to their nature, they do wonderful service. Well, not only wonderful service, they become creative in doing their service and it expands Krishna consciousness in all directions. Like that. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Thank, thank you. Uh, that answers my question. Uh, but I, I have a. I would like to ask another question in connection with this. Uh, it is sometimes viewed that um, Shri Prabhupada wanted to establish, um, spe specifically as a center of Anashama Dharma, these uh, self-sustaining farm communities. He says this is the best way to to implement this Anashama Dharma. He says the cities are not possible. He said every city temple should have a farm community connected to it. And then the cities would be where the brahmacharis are. And they could go out and preach and make devotees. And then send them to the farms for training. And for service like that. 
He said the farms are generally not for brahmacharis. They're mostly for grihastas. <laughs> brahmacharis should be in the city for preaching, for studying, like that. Yeah, so the farm communities are more or less the uh, best environment for developing this, this Van Arshram. Mm -hmm. Preach, make devotees, send them to the farms. <laughs> it's not Temple really means preaching. Prabhupada's idea was that everybody should be going out every day and there should be enough devotees back to maintain the deities, that's all. Not that everyone, not that. If you're not engaged in deity worship, you should be out. That's basically Prabhupada's program. And that way the devotees stay fired up doing books or going through pro going to programs, giving lectures like that, inviting people to come to the temple and training them when they get to the temple and seeing how much they're inclined to devotional service. And if they are, we can suggest they move to the farms and become more and more fixed in the regular Krishna conscious activity. Doesn't take many devotees to maintain a temple. <laughs> but we need a lot of devotees for preaching though. That's mm -hmm. yeah. not working. No. Hare Krishna. I heard that Sri Prabhupada once said at some point in time, now we have enough men, now we need to boil down the milk. Could you please say something? Yeah, about that was that? a letter that he wrote to Karandar in 1970. Four, I believe it was, saying that we need to train our men more instead of going out and trying to make more. So now the time is to boil the milk. Now he, he Prabhupada said, let's let's put. He always used to say, you know, what is the use of a lot of twinkling stars if you have one moon? He can light up the sky. So let's let's engage our devotees, let's educate our devotees, let them all become first class, not that we just have a bunch of numbers and they don't know much about the philosophy, they're not really so enthusiastic to engage in different, they're not so surrendered. So Prabhupada wanted to just tighten things up with the devotees we have, make them stronger, and then go out and preach. So it was a time, place, and circumstance statement that he made. Boil the milk. Make everybody a pure devotee. Well, there's two kinds of pure devotees. Everyone can be a pure devotee in one minute. It's just a, one second you can become a pure devotee. There is, but there's two classes. One is those, those who are purified from all material desires and who are fully engaged in devotional service. That's the general definition of a pure devotee. But there's another kind, those who are uh, purely surrendered. In other words, they may not be, they still may have material desires, but they're surrendered completely in devotional service. So they're practicing pure devotional service, and eventually they'll come to the stage of purified consciousness and purified heart. 
But what is their success is that they are fully surrendered. They're ready to serve in any way that is necessary. They have full faith in the process. So that's what we want to make, devotees who have complete faith and are completely surrendered. Because then they can go anywhere and do anything and and you know, make a lot of make others Krishna conscious and help helps ex, helps expand the movement. So Prabhupada said, and that's the same time he established his um, um, Bhakti Vaibhava, Bhakti Shastra, Bhakti Vedanta, Bhakti Sarvabhoma. 1974. He also wrote a letter. Tamal Krishna Goswami wrote the letter describing the whole system of education that Prabhupada wanted to implement. Prabhupada signed the letter, giving it an endorsement, and then he described what it meant. All our devotees should be fully educated in all our books. And then he made the gradations, you know, Bhakti Shastra, four books, uh, Bhakti Vaibhava, those four books plus the first six cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhakti Vedanta, those four books plus the entire Bhagavatam, and Bhakti Sarvabhoma, everything included, and then Chaitanya Charitamrita. So in Mayapur and in Vrindavan, uh, they've reached the level of teaching Bhakti Vedanta. They haven't established Bhakti Sarvabhoma yet. But if devotees can learn Bhagavad Gita, Nectar Instructions, Nectar Devotion, Sri Upanishads, and Srimad Bhagavatam, they can preach anywhere and remain fit, super fixed in devotional service. And that's what Prabhupada wanted. He just didn't want a lot of devotees, a lot of people who had no, no knowledge of the scriptures, who were just, you know, you know, surrendered conditionally surrendered like that. That's what he meant by boiling the milk. Let's educate our devotees. Let's help them develop devotional qualities. It's not just philosophical education. It's developing the qualities of a Vaishnava. And then that's mentioned in the Bhagavatam, the 26 qualities of a Vaishnava. These are the qualities when a device have Vaishnav has these twenty six qualities. He has reached the stage of perfect character, perfect spiritual character. So yeah, that was Prabhupada's uh, understanding. As he was observing the movement, it was expanding, but he was seeing that it wasn't so the devotees weren't so strong. They were spiritually weak. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. We have to know this knowledge. We have all these books. They look nice on the shelf, but that's not good enough. We have to read them, study them. And Prabhupada wanted, there was a systematic study of his books. Systematic. With tests and uh, different what we say, uh, awards, just like I teach Bhakti Vaibhava every year in Mayapur. And I taught Bhakti Vedanta last year. So at the end of the semester, they have a big ceremony. And those devotees who took the classes, they're, they're giving, they get a certificate that you are now accredited in Bhakti Vedanta, Bhakti Vaibhava, like that. So, it's, uh, yeah, our movement is an educational movement along with a spiritual, you know, movement, a spiritual education. Prabhupada's mission was to translate Srimad Bhagavatam and give the Bhaktivedanta purports so the whole world could understand this knowledge. He put everything in his Bhaktivedanta purports. 
So we have to take advantage of this <clears throat> through systematic study of the books. You can do that here now while we're here. You can have a class every day. The brahmacharis can have a class. Come together, pick one section of the disasters, read it, and discuss it. Bodhiantas parasparam katiantas chimam nityam tushyanticha romanticha. The, the, the thoughts of my devotees dwell in me, their lives are surrendered unto me, and they derive great uh, happiness and, I forgot, let me get the exact, they derive great, let's see, I know. Mm -hmm. the thoughts of my pure devotees dwell in me, their lives are fully devoted to me, my service, and they derive great satisfaction and bliss from always enlightening one another and conversing about me. So this is the program of devotees to enlighten one another in Krishna consciousness and talk about Krishna. Otherwise, the mind is not, the mind will gravitate towards other subjects. If we don't really hear and chant the glories of the Lord, we'll be hearing and chanting you know, the news, you know. <laughs> the intelligence must be used, otherwise it'll divert itself towards mundane subjects. Or the mind will be, well, one will remain unfulfilled. Intelligence requires to be fed <laughs> with transcendental knowledge. Hmm. Is there anything else? Something coming from outside? Uh, we have a question by <coughs> Lilavatar Devidasi. Uh, does the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also include preaching to devotees and taking care of devotees also, or is it just meant to um, bring new people in, to preach no, to new taking people? taking care of devotees is, yeah. Service to, the, service to devotees means taking care of devotees. So Vaishnava Seva is the highest thing, highest form of service. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu not only you know, spread the holy name around, but he's, he did, he taught his own devotees too. And he served his own devotees. Mm -hmm. Now, so Vaishnava, Lord Chaitanya emphasized two things, chanting the holy names in Vaishnava Seva. His mission was Namruchi, Vaishnava Seva, Jivadoya. Sivadoya means compassion to the fallen souls, which comes out in the form of teaching and preaching. Vaishnava Seva means to serve the devotees who are also serving and to uh, glorify the Lord by developing a taste for chanting Hare Krishna and the Moham Mantra. So, so that's a big part of Lord Chaitanya's mission. In fact, it's a very big part. Serving the Vaishnavas. Mm -hmm. And that's something that should be actively engaged in. In other words, one should look for opportunities to serve the devotees. One should think, well, I'll serve the devotees if the chance comes, and then that's it. No. One should be looking how to serve the devotees. And then you'll find you get so many ideas, Krishna will show you. So many ways you can do Vaishnava Seva. Yeah. So thank you for your question. And that's the key. Vaishnava Seva. Mm -hmm. 
And Vaishnav Seva means taking care of devotees. Yeah. <laughs> Making sure they get everything they need so they can execute Krishna consciousness favorably. <laughs> Everything they need means not just your day-to-day -day basic needs, but anything they need. Anything. If they need medical care, if they need, if someone wants to get married, if someone needs some financial assistance, all these things fall into the category of taking care of Vaishnavas, educating Vaishnavas, engaging Vaishnavas, Develop friendships with Vaishnavas. Hmm. It's all part of the you know, Vaishnav Seva. Anything else? Mm -hmm. This is this is question by Mahananda Hladini Dasi. Uh, we can see that. Um, when devotee is young or new in Krishna consciousness, uh, he is more dedicated and serves others more and uh, performs more service for Krishna. And how years, years pass, it seems that, uh, that we can become more lazy and uh, uh, there, is, there is lack of enthusiasm in our spiritual life. So how to improve this? Well, a lot of that's due to either offenses or not understanding what is the purpose of devotional service. When one begins devotional service, it looks very, what we say, uh, attractive. The, everything is attractive. The deities look so good, the devotees look so good, the prasadam is so good, the kirtans are so good, everything is so good. But then after a while, one starts to get familiar and starts to take these things as more or less just, you know, routine. So we lose that in, initial uh, enthusiasm that comes with the newness. And then we start to look at it in that way. Therefore, one has to be always thinking, well, you know, devotees are special. Therefore, let me serve the devotees. And one should always be eager to chant, to read, to serve, to associate. That eagerness comes when uh, we uh, follow the process carefully. If we cut and paste, well, I like this, I don't like this, we may get you know a little routine or mechanical. Then we see devotional services for me. It's what I like, and I get enthusiastic when I like something, and when I don't like something, I don't. I lose my enthusiasm. So devotional service is for Krishna, but it purifies. But it's ultimately for the practitioner because it purifies the heart. So we have to be careful not to get familiar in the sense that we start seeing everything as being routine, ordinary. Just like the materialists, when they enter into something, they get involved with it and they become inspired at the beginning. And then after a while, they get a little bored or they want to change, they want to do something new or something. So material life means to keep changing until you finally, you know, can't change anymore. <laughs> you have to die. But the spiritual life means that everything is always, well, they say, nava yovanam, it's fresh. But unless our consciousness is in the right place, we'll see it as work. It's not work. It's service to the Supreme. <laughs> yeah, so that can happen. And... Usually what happens is devotees go through that. Beginning, they're enthusiastic. Then they fall into this more mechanical. Then after a while, if they stay in Krishna consciousness, they get out of that, and then they get back into a 
a really, what we say, enthusiastic effort. But in that interim period, sometimes people will, might decide to go away if they become mechanical, lazy, offensive, or just routine. You know. When the alarm rings in the morning, one should think, Jai, I'm glad sleep is over. Now I can get up and another day to serve Krishna. Wonderful. Not like, oh no. <laughs> Hit the snooze button. <laughs> you keep hitting it. Until finally you hit the button to click off the uh, alarm at all. Yeah, I'm feeling like... The thing is, when you even if you feel a little tired, get up anyway. As soon as you start performing devotional service, that tiredness falls away. Set your clock according to how much you feel like you need and get up. And then be enthusiastic. Immediately... But what's the first thing we do? We pay our obeisances to the spiritual master. We chant the names of our worshipful deities. We uh, immediately start preparing to take care of our body. But while we're doing that, we're chanting. We're chanting the holy name. We're chanting prayers. You know, I know devotees, as soon as they wake up, they turn on Prabhupada's lecture. As soon as they wake up. You know. I know devotee, uh, devotees who play Prabhupada's bhajans as soon as they get up. You know, immediately connect with the sp spiritual sound vibration. And then, you know, prepare yourself. And then when you're ready, sit down and look forward to chanting. Not like, oh no, here it comes again, 16 rounds. Boy, I got to do it. I have to climb Mount Kilimanjaro again every day. It's not like that. There's a there's a little s statement that says, I get the chant, I want the chant, I love the chant. Chant that every day. <laughs> I get the chant, it's a privilege, I look forward to chanting, and I really enjoy chanting. And you do, because if you miss it one or two days, you feel terrible. You don't miss it. But the thing is, we don't look forward to it because we think it's too difficult. You know, we have to fight this lazy mind. The mind wants to do whatever it wants to do. <laughs> But we have to apply spiritual knowledge. We have to act on the platform of intelligence and not on the platform of the mind. The mind will follow the intelligence when the intelligence is directing it towards Krishna. Otherwise, if the intelligence is like the mind, then you have two enemies. <laughs> so getting up early, be enthusiastic, chant, dance. Of course, we... Right now, because of the lockdown, things are in, at a very low key. But still, that doesn't mean we should do anything less. Mm -hmm. I listen to Mangalarti even if I don't come to the actual function. I hear Prabhupada every day chant Mangalarti, the whole prayers. We chant them. I chant the Mangalu. And what is it? The uh, Mangala Charanam prayers every day. And we can chant Shikshastika prayers. We can do that. We can worship our deities. So many things. Even if things change because of circumstances, we shouldn't give up our sadhana. Stay enthusiastic. Sadhana is the basis of seva, and seva is the basis of advancement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was one devotee, very senior devotee in our movement. 
He said, even if I don't feel enthusiastic, I act enthusiastic. <laughs> he says, when I do that, then I become enthusiastic. And that works. That's in Krishna consciousness. If you act according to how you're supposed to, you develop the mood. Just like sometimes we say, well, I don't feel like dancing. Get up and dance. When you get up and dance, you'll start feeling like you, and you start dancing. <laughs> and after a while, you start to enjoy it. It's a fact. Krishna consciousness is just applying our intelligence according to the directions of the guru and shastra into the activities given. And as we do that, we actually get the experience. So that that application of intelligence, as Rupa Goswami explains, is enthusiasm. He says, enthusiasm means to endeavor with intelligence. In other words, to follow strictly instructions of the spiritual master for the application of devotional service. So. And then what becomes mechanical at the beginning becomes natural at a certain point. Mm -hmm. It's no longer like, oh, I got to do this. No, I want to do this. I look forward to it. <clears throat> Anything else? Hare uh, Krishna. I sometimes heard um, the phrase fake it till you make it in Krishna consciousness. <laughs> How does that really apply? Ah, it's kind of a loose statement, fake it till you make it. In other words, even if you don't feel like it, do it anyway. <laughs> I just pretty much explained that. It's not, in the material world, that applies that statement. In Krishna consciousness, it's not about faking anything. It's simply about using your intelligence I don't feel like it, but that doesn't matter. Still, let me go ahead and do it. Not only do it, but do it in the best possible way. That's the difference between material and spiritual activities. Behind the spiritual activities, there's a person. That's Krishna. He's accepting your service. So if you're enthusiastic, then he's accepting your service and he's reciprocating it. And you're feeling satisfied, you're feeling happy, you're developing knowledge, you're getting free from material attachments. All these things are happening as you do your service. Material life means to fake it till you make it. Spiritual life means to apply the knowledge until finally it comes, knowledge reveals everything. There's that verse in the fifth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Nice verse, really a beautiful verse. Jnane na tu tat ka jnanam yesam nasitam atmanam tesham adityava aditya va jnanam prakasananti tatparam When, however, one is enlightened with the knowledge by which Deshans is destroyed, then his knowledge reveals everything as the sun lights up everything in the daytime. Prabhupada says, those who have forgotten Krishna must certainly be bewildered. Those who are in Krishna consciousness are not bewildered at all. So, yeah, by applying the principles of Krishna consciousness, you get transcendental knowledge. Knowledge comes by service. It comes by reading the books, but it also comes through service. Krishna gives you 
knowledge simply when he's pleased with your service. He reveals transcendental knowledge and detachment from material things. Eagerness is the key to success. Anything else? Okay, we can stop here. That's uh, one hour and 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Ki Jai. Thank you.